And here we are, the last female servant in the show. You guys asked for it, so here she is. Actually, because I combined Kiron and her together, I'm not quite sure which one would have had the majority vote. So I just took the liberty to assume that you would all be in favor of the cute green haired girl with cat ears. So let me present to you the Virgin Huntress of Greek mythology, Atalanta, or as we know her from Fate Apocrypha, the Archer of Red. Since this is the first Archer we're covering, you already know we gotta talk about the class in general before anything else. This probably has to be my favorite servant class. You know, since every Archer in the Fate Stay Night universe happened to be pretty badass. Not to say the Archers in Fate Apocrypha aren't good, but honestly, Gilgamesh and Emiya would probably shit all over them. Anyway, the Archer is the third of the Knight classes, and known for being the heroic spirit of the bow. In order to be classified as an Archer, the Servant would have needed to possess a very powerful projectile type weapon. Not necessarily a bow, but any weapon that can shoot, even a gun or a slingshot. Like, take Gilgamesh for example. He didn't have a bow, but since his Gate of Babylon literally shot any conceivable weapon out at the speed of light, then he was classified as an Archer. Also, Archers tend to have some of the strongest noble phantasms, since the heroic spirits that become Archers usually originate from the Age of the Gods. A time where the world was shrouded in mystery for it had just begun, and the only known existence was that of supernatural phenomenon. And you know how much a legend can mold a servant's very being, meaning that the crazier the legend, the more OP the servant can become. So since these are legends from the very beginning of time where nothing was certain, anything can be said for these heroic spirits. As long as it's the most accepted legend, it'll be brought into form in the Holy Grail War. But what of our Huntress Atalanta? The last time I checked, she wasn't related to any notable deities. Well, she was born as the daughter of the King of Arcadia, a region in Greece named after the hunter Arcus, who, if you know your Greek mythology, was the son of Zeus and Callisto. But her father, the king, wanted a son. And as you know from my previous episodes, any parent that doesn't want their children leaves them abandoned somewhere. This time it wasn't by the river, it was up in the mountains in the wilderness. In the historical legend, it's said that Atalanta was found by a she-bear who then fed and cared for her so that she could survive. She was later found by hunters who then raised her. But in the fate-altered version, it's said that Artemis, the goddess of the hunt and daughter of Zeus and Leto, felt pity on Atalanta, and provided her with divine protection by creating the she-bear who would suckle her until the group of hunters would take her in. As she was raised by these hunters who constantly traversed mountainous and forested areas in search of prey, she was able to learn their skills merely through observation. This led to her becoming known as a huntress with no match, and her numerous adventures attested to that fact. She also became a valued member of the group that you may know as Jason and the Argonauts, a band of heroes that stem from Greek mythology for their quests in search of the Golden Fleece. As a member of this group, she was able to meet the hero known as Meleager. He fell in love with Atalanta, but it was not returned since she had already thrown away such desires due to the fact of her being a devout follower of the virgin goddess Artemis. Also, during this time they were in a city known as Kaladin, in which it was customary to offer the first fruits of the harvest to the gods as a sign of respect. But the foolish king Onius, Meleager's father, did not include Artemis in the offerings. So you know how gods are when they aren't respected, they gotta put these silly humans in their place. So Artemis, being the goddess of the hunt, sends a wild boar known as the Caledonian boar to kill cattle and destroy crops, which honestly doesn't seem like that harsh of a punishment. But anyway, Meleager, his two uncles, and Atalanta set out to stop this boar after numerous heroes who had already attempted were killed in the battle. Atalanta was known for being the one to draw first blood in this hunt by shooting it with an arrow before anyone else could strike. But the one who would claim the kill was Meleager. Regardless, Meleager being the gentleman he is, gave the reward of the boar's hide to Atalanta. However, the uncles were upset that they didn't get any prize and claimed that a woman was unworthy of it. Meleager just killed them right then and there for badmouthing his girl, which in turn resulted in him being killed by his mother, which then resulted in his mother being killed by another wild boar. Crazy stuff, I know. Now this story of Atalanta's success in the boar hunt reached far and wide, even the heirs of her father that abandoned her. The king ended up seeking her out, and when finally reunited, tricked her into coming home by saying that she could stay a virgin if she returned. But that soon changed when many suitors began seeking permission for marriage. This of course meant breaking her vow to Artemis. At first, she wholeheartedly rejected the idea, but after much pestering from her father, she agreed to the marriage under one condition. They had to beat her in a foot race, and if they lost, death would be the result for them. 
Of course, this was an extremely difficult task to handle, especially because she was the fastest human amongst the Argonauts. Now, many men attempted, and just as many failed, but one in particular knew that he couldn't win, so instead he made a deal with Aphrodite to allow him to win the race. Aphrodite gave this man three golden apples, which in Greek mythology are items that are coveted by gods and men alike. So whenever Atalanta would take the lead in the race, a golden apple was chucked in the opposite direction and Atalanta would chase after it so she could have the irresistible fruit. Of course this resulted in Atalanta losing the race. Now the man who had won was so overjoyed that he had that he forgot to give thanks to Aphrodite. So just as Artemis got pissed before for being neglected, so did Aphrodite. In turn, she made this man's lust toward Atalanta so strong that he would have no choice but to force himself onto her the next time they met. This so happened to be in one of Zeus's temples. Now, it's not certain whether this action disrespected Zeus or Atalanta breaking her vow disrespected Artemis, but it is known that one of the gods transformed them into lions as punishment. And that would be the end of her legend. Now, in Fate, you may be wondering why she cares so much for this lolly assassin psycho murderer. It's said that because she was abandoned then saved as a child, as well as managed to keep her vow of chastity to the very end, she is known as the symbol of purity for all children. Which makes sense of why she felt so much for all those abandoned children's souls. As she herself was abandoned at birth, she can't help but relate to their feelings. So if you were to go back to the end of episode 22, it makes that last scene a whole lot more meaningful. Another key thing to note though is her appearance. The cat ears and tail are certainly not just for show. It's all symbolic of her upbringing in the wilderness and her various adventures and feats throughout her life. But anyway, let's move on to her abilities now. She's described to be more animal than human, meaning that she has heightened senses that allow her to detect enemies far before any human or servant could. Then she has her bow called Teropolis, Bow of Heaven, the Boar Killer, a bow blessed and gifted by Artemis. The bow apparently shoots arrows that can pierce anything and when drawn fully, results in a top tier physical attack. Atalanta tends to combine her superior eyesight and skill with a bow to snipe enemies from lengthy distances in masterful surprise attacks. Then she has two noble phantasms, the first being Phoebus Catastrophe, Complaint Message on the Arrow. This is an interesting ability, because it's technically not her performing the attack. Instead, she fires an arrow to the sky, which serves as a sign towards the gods Apollo and Artemis, asking for their divine protection. But what's needed in return for this divine protection is calamity. So the return message is the calamity of the gods in the form of arrows of light raining down from the sky on her enemies. She can even control the area of effect of these return arrows, whether it be focused on a single enemy or over an entire battlefield. Obviously, the more concentrated the arrows are, the more damage it will do. Then there's Agrius Metamorphosis, Boar of Divine Punishment, obviously in reference to the Caledonian Boar. It's in the shape of its hide which was the reward that Meliager gave her for helping in the hunt, but it is a cursed weapon that could result in her death, because when it's used, she loses all sense or reason. What remains is just the ferocity of her inner beast. Essentially, this pelt, when worn, turns her into a berserker, giving her all the power of the boar that was summoned by Artemis, as well as the mad enhancement berserker skill. She also gains the ability to transform herself and bow to adapt to any environment. It's a cool noble phantasm, but really not too usable in a holy grail war if she's trying to win, since it'll most likely result in her self-destruction. And that's Atalanta. Hopefully everything makes sense now, cause Atalanta seems to have had her backstory skimmed over in this series. Fate Apocrypha is really one of those shows where unless you know the backgrounds of each of the servants, you're really not going to understand their motives or characteristics since they're entirely based off of their legends. And that's what makes Fate Apocrypha so cool. The level of detail that's put into crafting these heroic spirits makes the show seem that much more refined once you understand their reason for doing certain things. The interactions between servants start to make a lot more sense when the gaps in who they are start getting filled in. Anyway, as always, thanks for watching, and don't forget to go vote in the community poll for which servant you uncovered next. So until then, ciao!